The way we depict the Greek gods in modern culture is derived from the way the ancient Greeks themselves represented their gods through works of art, such as sculpture and paintings. However, the Greek gods are not represented exactly the same way today as they once were. Throughout history, some of these gods have undergone changes in appearance, which could be brought on by a number of influences. In this video, we plan to look at the Greek god of the grape harvest, wine, and theater, Dionysus, and his image transformation. Before we look at Dionysus' transformation from his slim Greek representation into his chubby and jolly modern-day image seen in such movies like Disney's Fantasia or on television shows like The Simpsons, it's important that we look at some of his background information first. Dionysus' father, according to the Greek stories, was Zeus, the Greek god of gods. However, Dionysus' mother was a mortal woman. Even so, in some traditions, Dionysus was able to eventually become an Olympic god when Zeus declared that he deserved a seat for his invention of wine. By assuming his seat on Mount Olympus, Dionysus did two things. He became the only Olympic god with a mortal parent, and he became the youngest god to become an Olympian. When he isn't on Mount Olympus, Dionysus is often depicted as a traveling god who would wander the world spreading his cult and planting grapes. It is important to know that Dionysus, like many of the other Greek gods, had a Roman counterpart named Bacchus. The interesting thing in Dionysus' case is that both Greeks and Romans call him Bacchus, which in the Greek tradition is believed to have at one time been a surname for Dionysus. This important distinction brings forth a very important piece of information about Dionysus, and that is the dual nature of his divinity. Where the image of Dionysus is found, there is usually a great deal of merriment. A great example of this is a fresco found in the Villa of the Mysteries. The fresco, which has been centered on the image of Dionysus and his mother Samil, is believed to depict the initiation rites for a person wishing to join the cult of Dionysus. Although there are scenes within the fresco that show pain and suffering, such as the scene depicting torture and transformation, the fresco begins and ends with merriment, starting with the image of musicians playing and the initiative dancing, and ending with the image of Eros, the Greek god of love. However, where Bacchus is concerned, there is a different narrative. She was mad, stark mad, possessed by Bacchus. Ignoring his cries of pity, she seized his left arm at the wrist. Then, planting her foot on his chest, she pulled, wrenching away the arm at the shoulder, not by her own strength, for the god had put inhuman power in her hands. This excerpt comes from the play The Bacchae, and was written by Athenian playwright Euripides. This play premiered in Corinth around 400 BC, and eventually even won prizes at the Dionysia, a theater theatrical competition held in Athens in honor of Dionysus. In this work of art, we see the rage and ferocity facilitated by Bacchus and can begin to see the dichotomy within the god. This dichotomy also makes itself well known in the artistic way that Dionysus is presented. We begin with Dionysus in archaic art, where the only type of face for him is the bearded Dionysus, which represents the full vigor of manhood. However, as the god Dionysus begins to become more associated with the traveling aspect of his story, his image begins to change. When the god entered Thebes, it was said he looked like a stranger from an eastern land. With time, this Asian and feminine influence on Dionysus continued until artists began to even depict him in a bazaar, an Asian woman's robe, instead of the traditional tunic. By the 4th century BC, the image of Dionysus had become almost completely feminine in appearance, and when Praxiteles inaugurated a tradition of Dionysus' emotions, these emotions included a heightened sense of enthusiasm. This is, even today, a main characteristic of Dionysus, the embodiment of merriment and ecstasy. Bacchus, on the other hand, went through an entirely different makeover. Starting in the same place as Dionysus, as a bearded and strong man, Bacchus, who encompasses the evils of overindulgence, would begin to undergo a change in appearance that showed the gluttonous nature of his character. When Marco Dente engraves the image of Bacchus in his early 16th century work titled Bacchus, 
the god can clearly be seen to have lost his athletic image for a growing stomach. By the time Peter Paul Rubens paints Bacchus in Flanders, the god has lost any grasp on his waistline. This work, also titled Bacchus, depicts the drunken god filling his cup to the point it overflows while he sits, too fat to get up. Another point of interest between the two works of art are that they both contain the image of a tiger. In the Dente work, the tiger appears lean, begging Bacchus for grapes. In the Rubens work, the tiger is fat, rolling on the ground and appearing to be drunk. This may also show a shift in the image of Bacchus, solidifying him as the, a god encouraging overindulgence and gluttony. To bridge this image gap, we turn to Greece's philosophical rival, Germany. Nietzsche visionalizes aspects. He reinterprets them. He even invents them. The end process is two new composites, which carry the Greek god's name as symbols without any consistent historical justification. In this quote, Nietzsche is morphing the images of Apollo and Dionysus to serve him as he pleases. By using the names of the Greek god, he incorporates all of the associations previously made with the god. Then, by picking and choosing which characteristics to highlight, he can add his own interpretations of the god to form new characteristics. This is exactly what we see happening in Fantasia and Hercules. Dionysus remains the name of the character, bringing with it all the associations of wine drinking and drunkenness, while we in today's culture supply the rosy cheeks and fatness to make him appear even more jolly. So the question we should be asking ourselves is did we make Dionysus plump or did we make Santa Claus drunk?